Tisha, the housing crisis is still getting worse. Uh, every week I am meeting people, workers, two people working together. They are earning over the limit in terms of social uh, housing uh, and they're simply not able to afford anywhere in terms of the market. Uh, they're spending all their money on a week by week basis on their rent. They can't save up a deposit. They're utterly trapped. The market has failed those people. But even the affordable housing that you're talking about, take the example of cost rental, because in my constituency now, we have some cost rental. But affordability is defined by the government, not in relation to how much income people have and whether they can afford it, but in relation to a percentage reduction off of an utterly unaffordable market rate. So you claim that if you go 25% below the market rate, then that's somehow affordable. But it's still unaffordable. I'll give you the example of new development in City West. Rent, cost rental, 1,390 for a one bed, 1,580 for a two bed, 1,750 for a three bed. It's still unaffordable for huge numbers of workers. You're talking about people who have a net income of a couple of 66,000 euros or less. If they're at the very highest rate, if they're at 66,000, that's 31% of their income gone on housing for a three bed. If they're less than that, quickly you're up to 40% or 50%. These are not affordable just by virtue of you saying they're slightly less than a massively unaffordable level. Do you accept that point, that that much money is not affordable Definitely. and that we need to have properly affordable, which one thing means getting rid of the limits for social housing and allowing anybody to apply for social housing. Lee Barry, please. Um, thank you, Kerlock. Um, Deputy Durkin raised the issue of uh, institutional investors, uh, and I want to say the government absolutely recognises the need for protections to prevent institutional investors displacing owner occupiers. Uh, for this reason, we introduced tax and planning changes to protect traditional family houses from bulk purchase. Uh, these include changes that were introduced in May 2021 to the rate of stamp duty on bulk purchases. A 10% stamp duty levy was introduced by government for the cumulative purchase of 10 or more residential houses in a 12-month period. Uh, and also, Section 28 guidelines for planning authorities provide for an owner-occupier guarantee, preventing multiple units being sold to a single buyer in new estates. Although, of course, this doesn't apply retrospectively to permissions granted before 2021. About 40,000 homes have received planning permission with conditions attached to them prohibiting bulk purchase or multiple sale to a single purchaser uh, since that law was brought in, in. And we are considering further measures. Uh, we believe the role for institutional investors is to finance new housing developments that otherwise wouldn't be built, uh, not to buy up existing ones when people had a legitimate expectation that they may be, may be able to buy them themselves. Uh, Deputy Dillon raised the issue of affordable housing schemes in Mayo. Uh, and I agree that we need to have a mix of affordable housing schemes and social housing schemes. It shouldn't just be social housing. Um, the arguments made in the past is, is that in some counties where affordability is better than others, um, that they don't need these schemes. I don't agree with that view. I think every county should have at least one scheme. Um, uh, but I would also point out that there are other ways to achieve affordability than affordable housing schemes. Help to buy does it by helping people to afford their deposit, and the first home scheme uh, can close the gap uh, between uh, what somebody gets in terms of mortgage approval and the cost of building a new home. Um, in terms of affordability, I think there are lots of ways that we can achieve it. Social housing is clearly one. Uh, as I said before, benefits everyone, takes people off the housing list, frees up properties uh, for other people to rent, has a downward dampening effect on house prices, and that's why we're building more social housing now than at any point since the 1970s. And deputies might be interested to know that if you compare 2022 census with the census 10 years ago, uh, there are 40,000 more families in social housing than was the case back in 2011, and the percentage of people living in social housing is now higher than it was 10 years ago. And I think that shows how committed this government and previous governments um, in the past 10 years have been to social housing. Um, we're, all, we're also trying to reduce the cost of building homes uh, by waiving development levies, by servicing more land, by reducing the cost of finance, by focusing on vacancy, uh, and also on help to buy. And let's never forget that what help to buy is. This is tax that people have already paid. It's their own tax they're getting back. Um, and they can put it towards their deposit. And I think it'd be a terrible thing if that was taken away. Uh, on the Vienna model, uh, Vienna's a great city, 
been there many times, uh, love the place, um, but there are merits and demerits to his housing model. Uh, and one of the things people in Vienna tell me is that because there's such a focus on public housing, it's very hard to own your own home uh, in Vienna. And in fact, in fact, home ownership rates in Austria are among the lowest in Europe and are lower than they are in Ireland. And I'm not sure if that's the model. I'm not sure that's the model that people want in Ireland, um, where people are less likely to own their own home and are in public housing for life, no matter how good and secure it may be. Um, in terms of vacancy, uh, I think we all appreciate that there'll always be some level of vacancy, um, but there's still too much of it. It's still too common, even though vacancy rates are falling. Uh, and I agree with Deputy Barry that local authorities need to be more assertive and more proactive in what they do in terms of vacancy. Uh, some are better than others. I think uh, Waterford's a very good example of a local authority that is particularly active when it comes to vacancy, and other local authorities could learn from that. Um, as a government, we're adopting a carrot and stick approach. Uh, we have 150 billion euros now available to local authorities to purchase derelict properties and bring them back into use. Um, they can buy the property, sell it on, uh, use the money again to buy another property, really encouraging local authorities to do that. Um, they have CPO powers, which aren't used enough in my view. There's a derelict site levy, which they're often too slow to impose. Uh, there's the vacant property tax as well. Uh, and there's also grants now available to individuals uh, to um, renovate properties and bring them back into use. Uh, over 3,000 of those uh, approved uh, and the drawdown is, 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 is picking up. Um, finally, just on the issue of a social housing passport um, raised by Deputy Sullivan, I'll have to come back to him on that issue. Uh, I think it's a good idea, particularly where people are moving back to their home county, that they would carry their years, if you like, with them. Uh, I just want th one thing we just would need to guard, guard against is people being on multiple lists, because that can create all sorts of difficulties if people are on housing lists in several different authorities. Um, on the land registry issue, I'm afraid I don't have any information for Deputy Tobin on that. Um, but there are lots of options available to people, uh, people who are still uh, in financial distress from the crash 12, 13 years ago. Mortgage to rent is one option, personal solvency is another option. And I'd certainly say to anyone to get good legal advice and good financial advice uh, on their options. And then on the housing adaptation grant, um, Mr. Donlatty made a statement on that earlier in the Dáil today, which I think is probably a more up-to-date response than I can give.